Thank you. Um, I've been railing about the uh, subject of uh, senior benefits, entitlement spending, and budget deficits for about, uh, I think I started in 1982. And I didn't realize what a relentless bore I had become <laughs> until uh, Ted Sorensen introduced me a number of years ago. Ted, you'll remember, was President Kennedy's assistant. And he said, Peterson and I were on a trip to the Mideast together. <clears throat> and on the plane just before it landed, two terrorists stood up, pulled out their machine guns, and said, we're going to assassinate these two former uh, public officials on a thoroughly bipartisan basis, you know, one Republican, one Democrat. We're going to give them each their last wish. <laughs> so they go to Peterson and say, Peterson, what's your last wish? And Peterson says, well, I have one last speech I want to give on the relationship between entitlement spending, budget deficits, and the American dream. They then go to Sorensen and say, all right, Sorensen, you've heard Peterson, what's your last wish? And Sorensen says, I've heard Peterson make that speech. My last speech is, my last wish is to be shot first. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I drive uh, my critics not simply to suicide, but... Uh, the various forms of rhetorical assassination. I made a list the other day of the more charitable descriptions of uh, my positions. Most recently, I've been referred to as the intellectual Dr. Kervorkian. Mm -hmm. And uh, not too long ago, the uh, intellectual bridge to the 16th century. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wanted to warn you up front that uh, there are a lot of characterizations of uh, what I have to say. Um, what I'd like to do today, because I, I know that many of you are very sophisticated about the aging phenomenon in the United States, is to try to practice a little, uh, I was presumably educated at the University of Chicago where our patron saint was Adam Smith, and you know, he taught us all about comparative advantage, so whenever we're making a talk, I try to imagine what, what conceivable thing might I have to add to whatever your own knowledge is. And I thought I'd spend a little more time today than people normally do on the global aspects of aging because it has not really received the attention that I'm confident it will. Well, let's talk about the demographics. <coughs> Presumably you all know that the boomers are a generation of about 76 million. That's 50% uh, larger than the previous generation. Presumably, you know that over the next, uh, into the next century, the retirees, that is the payees to all the assistants, are going to be growing five times faster than the workers, that is the taxpaying workers, which of course is the tension that creates uh, very serious fiscal imbalances. A particular interest that hasn't received uh, a lot of attention is the so-called explosion of the old old, that is the people over 85, which are projected to quadruple. And this is without any uh, of the great new genetic uh, splicing, uh, parts replacement, etc. breakthroughs that some people are, are uh, predicting. In one of the scenarios that strikes me as, uh, as quite credible, just to give you a visual metaphor, imagine a United States in which there are as many people over 85 as there are children under 5, just to give you a, a, a sense of what we're talking about. Now, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, <clears throat> to get another visual metaphor, I'd like you to focus on Florida, which we've all been to, where nearly 19% of the population are elderly, and what I thought I'd do is give you the years in which it is now projected various countries in the world will look like Florida as a country. In the United States, we hit that place about 2020, but Italy will be there about 2003, Japan 2005, and Germany 2006. So we're talking about profound changes here within the next uh, decade or so. Because of that, the populations over the age of 60 
are projected globally to be growing by 100 million, while the populations under 60 are projected to be dropping by about 200 million. Now, while this development is going to take place later in the developing world, which by and large is much younger, the sheer size of the numbers is kind of daunting. My colleague on the left, Dan Bernstein, as you know, is a great expert on China. It might be interesting for you to, to, to imagine that by the year 2030, China is projected to have 225 million people over the age of 65 which was in 1975 the elderly population of the entire world. Now we're going to see a, something we have not seen in a long time, which is a stunning drop in the number of workers, which not only has very important uh, productivity GDP implications, obviously, but has a lot of uh, implications on the fiscal sustainability of these programs, because as you know, these public programs are almost universally pay-as-you-go, which we depend on the taxes of the workers to pay for the benefits of the retirees. But to give you an idea of how rapidly this is going to be changing, by the year, in the single decade between 2000 and 2010, which is obviously not far from now, the number of Japanese workers under the age of 30 is projected to fall by 25% in absolute terms. If you look, look then to the working age populations of Italy, Germany, Netherlands, and Spain, you will see that their working age population, the entire, is expected to be dropping 1% per year, so that they will lose about 20% of the workforce between 2010 and 2030. The United States, due to some demographics that we can talk about if you wish, is expected to be virtually flat. Now, the other phenomenon of longevity is obviously one of the phenomena is fertility, so there has been some really uh, profound changes that have taken place, much more than you might have guessed unless you really look seriously at the numbers. The United States is at the very high end of the developed world, at roughly uh, two. But at the other extremes are countries that did not experience a baby boom after the Second World War, and their fertility has now plunged uh, uh, dramatically. For example, Japan is now 1.5, Germany is 1.3, and forget the Mama Mia stereotype of, uh, of Italy, you know, uh, a Catholic country. <laughs> Uh, they're having something called the Bambini bust <laughs> at 1.2. Now, this means that each family generation is only slightly more than half of the size of its parents. Now, <clears throat> the implication of this, of course, that is the, the uh, drop in, uh, in birth rates, is that population is going to start dropping in absolute terms in the developed countries. Uh, this decline will be mild in the United States because the replacement rate, as you probably know, is a little over two, and that's about where we are. But in the rest of the world, it's way below the replacement rate. Japan is now projected on a track to have about half of their current population by the year 2050. And one of the jokes uh, of Dr. Toyota, who Dan and I work with, is if we project it out a few centuries, there won't be any Japanese left. Um, but there are all kinds of implications that have only... Uh, I've been asking every economist I know, when was the last time there was a drop in population of developed countries? And what strikes me as interesting about it is very few of them <clears throat> have really thought much about it. And the only example anybody can think of is the Black Plague, you know, the so-called Black Death mm -hmm. in Europe. But we have not had any case studies of significant declines in, in population. Now, one speech for me is one too many, and uh, I'm going to focus today more on the fiscal implications of this combination of aging populations, unfunded uh, liabilities, 
that are huge and uh, declining populations. But just to titillate you a little bit, um, there are a variety of questions if you want to talk about. I, I know some of the questions. I, I don't know any of the answers. But to give you an idea of some of the issues this is going to raise, for example, it is inevitable, it seems to me, that if you have significant <clears throat> drops in population, along with huge unfunded liabilities that I'll get to in a moment, both the size and the shape of, of economies is going to change very significantly in the developed countries. I think it's pretty obvious that absent an unprecedented growth in productivity, you know the GDP is a product of growth in workers and growth in productivity. We're going to see something we have not experienced in a long time, which is a decline in absolute terms in GDP in some of these countries. And as you start to think about it, and I wish you would, because Dan and I spent a lot of time thinking about what, what are the implications, there are going to be certain sectors that are going to be very uh, importantly affected in very different ways by a decline in population. For example, uh, sectors related to much of the infrastructure uh, will be affected most severely. I think the, the housing and office uh, business will be affected uh, significantly in ways we can discuss. On the other hand, um, the good news from your standpoint and ours, because we're all in similar businesses here, it is my thesis that precisely because these programs are completely unsustainable public programs, mm. it is going to be essential that people rely more on private savings for retirement. And therefore, I think you're going to have an anomaly that is where certain sectors of our economies are going to be uh, severely impacted in a negative way. Others, in particular, the collection and management of savings, private savings, I think is inevitably going to become a, a, a very important growth business. The political implications are, are fascinating to contemplate. When you have a situation where you already, for example, in our country, have the AARP, and among my honors that you didn't mention was I'm told I had the hit list of the ARP. <laughs> and I'm deeply flattered by that characterization if it's true. Uh, you already have 34 million members of the ARP. They're already a formidable voting bloc that paralyzed and ter terrify many of our politicians. Mm -hmm. Imagine a world in which the number of elderly doubled. And these voting patterns continue as the number of young people declines. And you can either envision a new coalition of young and old, or you can envision what my friend Paul Songus used to worry a lot about, namely intergenerational wars, mm. which will raise uh, you know, significant not only fiscal questions, but social questions. Mm. Interesting to con contemplate on what happens to the relationships between developed countries and developing countries. Uh, up to now, the developed countries have been thought of as the major capital exporters to the developing countries. But because the developing countries are so much younger, and this aging boom is, is in back of the developed world, you may well have a situation where as the developed countries are starved for savings to finance these programs, they're going to start importing capital from the developing countries, which will raise not only important uh, financial questions, but political questions. There's a lot of talk now about the euro uh, in the EMU. The interesting to speculate what happens with some of the numbers I'll get to in a moment. If some of the countries in Europe, due to their rigidity of their political systems or the political coalitions they have, try to finance their way out of these unfunded liabilities, while other countries try to actually confront the problems and what kind of new strains is that going to create within uh, the euro when this problem starts hitting in about uh, 10 years or so. There are also some very fascinating issues raised on the health side. I was going to say the health ethics side, but I know how convincingly ethics comes uh, from an investment bank, and so I won't, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on that, but I can safely predict that is the over 85 year olds uh, quadruple or more. Mm -hmm. And remember that they use uh, much more health care than do the younger elderly. 
we're going to quickly find out that there simply aren't enough resources to handle uh, these problems the way we have in the past. And societies are going to have to confront a word that's going to be much more toxic, to, in my view, than the L word, namely the R word, for rationing. Mm. And how we're going to go about rationing, I think, is going to pose some really uh, incredibly uh, complex, daunting questions. Let me focus now just on the fiscal side. To give you an idea of the magnitude of what we're talking about here, let's start in the United States. Um, I need to tell you what the unfunded liabilities are. I find it quite anomalous that our politicians worry endlessly about the unfunded liabilities of the corporate pension plans, which are virtually non-existent at the moment. At the end of 95, even before the boom, were only $30 billion. And the unfunded liabilities of the public programs are now about $15 trillion. Uh, and I'm also amused to... Uh, hear the politicians talk to us about how they're going to spend this alleged surplus. Whereas if we used ERISA accounting of 30-year funding of our public liabilities, we would be a trillion dollars in uh, deficit at the present time. And the public officials would probably be going to jail. Um, now, as you look further out, the uh, CBO, which is by and large known, I think, as a fairly careful, prudent outfit, has estimated that the deficits in the United States in 2020 due largely to these programs would be 12% of the GDP, or about $800 billion in today's dollars. So we're, 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 we're talking about fantasy land here. These are simply unsustainable numbers. Now, if you look at the taxes that would re be required to pay for these programs, and you put Social Security and Medicare together in this country, and you said, uh, forget this trust fund business, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, the taxes required would be about a third to a half of payroll to cover Social Security and Medicare. And that's an unthinkable tax bill, politically, morally, economically. Now, what about the rest of the world? I thought our problems were um, daunting enough until I looked at uh, the other G7 countries and looked at their unfunded liabilities as a percent of GDP, and I was uh, disappointed to find that they're 50 to 100 percent larger than ours. Hmm. And if you aggregate the unfunded liabilities in the G7 countries just for pensions, not for health care, not for long-term care, just for pensions, they come to about $30 um, uh, trillion. Dollars. It's uh, an amount that's triple the size of the existing public debt. And it'd be much larger if we included uh, health care. Now, what's going to happen, obviously, since these are pay-as-you-go systems, if we don't reform, and my argument is that pre precisely because these numbers are insustainable, we're going to have to reform. And the only question is, do we do it under a severe crisis, or do we do it in a more rational way? Let's look at the annual operating deficits, which is what we have to look at, because that's what we have to borrow the money to finance. You probably all know the United States Social Security starts running a deficit about 2012 or 13. By 2030, the annual operating deficit is expected to be $700 billion. Now, you're going to hear endlessly about how the trust fund, so-called, my least favorite word in the, in the American language, um, will keep, will pay the benefits until the year 2029. I've totaled up what the deficits are that would have to be financed between 2012 and 2029, and it's $6.9 trillion that would have to be uh, financed. I'm told that's enough to pay for six weeks of the Lincoln bedroom. I don't know. <laughs> it's a large number beyond uh, imagination. Now, if you go to the rest of the world, because they are aging more rapidly and because they have much lower birth rates, the, the, the pension bills are much larger. For example, in Japan, by 2030, Pension spending alone is projected to go from 6.6 .6 to 13.4 percent, 
And you're looking here at 7% of the GDP increase just for one piece of the public um, uh, programs. Now, in addition to this, you have health care, of course. And I want to remind you that one of the implications of the explosion of the so-called old old is not only that we have to uh, pay benefits much longer than we than had ever been planned. You'll recall that when Social Security was set up, it was estimated that a person who was age 65 would, uh, on balance, be paid the benefits for about 11, 11 and a half years. You're now looking without health breakthroughs at numbers like 18 to 20 years. So you have, you've got a huge increase in the number of years that you have to pay the benefits. But something that is not often <coughs> considered is that as the old old explodes, the health care costs for them are much higher than for the younger elderly. By and large, just the health care costs, not long-term care, which is another bill on top of this, are about two and a half times what they are for the younger elderly. So we have the health care bills on top of the pension uh, bills. Mm -hmm. And in most countries, these are in, in more or less uh, entirely unfunded. So I put together the numbers for um, all of the G7 countries. And depending on which country you're talking about, it means that these costs are going to go up 10 to 15 percent of the GDP if we we're ever to try to finance them. Or if you want to think of them payroll taxes, it would come to, depending on which country, 15 to 40 percent of payroll. Now, just to give you an idea, the, 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 the pension programs alone in Italy are expected to exceed 50 percent of payroll. And I would think at some point that would start having, you know, immensely serious, not only economic effects, but political effects. Now, some people say very blithely, well, let's just raise taxes. Well, let's remember that in Europe, taxes are already 46% of the GDP. And most serious economists believe that their very high tax rates are one of the reasons they're having so much trouble uh, with their economy. Now, imagine adding 10 to 15% of the GDP on top of that. And I think you have essentially a... Uh, an unsustainable situation that way. Now, some people say, well, why don't we just try to finance these deficits? So what I've done is to try to compare what these deficits are in relation to the savings of the world. Now, by my calculations, by 2030, just for the pension programs, you'd have to borrow an additional 7.5% of the GDP uh, for those of you who are high glazed by GDP numbers, this is roughly $2.4 trillion in today's dollars, and it's four times greater than today's public sector deficits. Now compare that to the current level of net national savings, which is about 7.7%. And you have a situation where just for the pension programs, you would be absorbing 96% of the entire savings of the G7 countries just to be financing the pension deficits. And I present these numbers just to indicate uh, their unsustainability. <coughs> if you, uh, another number for you to think about is we, we in this country have depended heavily on importing capital, obviously, from Japan. So if you want to look at the swing in the Japanese deficit, which is coming very rapidly, by 2010, about 3% of the GDP, you'll see that it's three times larger <coughs> than their current exports to us of capital. So there are going to be some major implications here as to what happens to global capital markets. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we do about this melancholy uh, situation that I'm presenting? I'm going to use a technique I developed when I was in the, house, in the White House. We call this the option B approach. Mm -hmm. you, you take your uh, the people you disagree with and you make one of them option A and the other one option C and by comparison your option seems uh, totally reasonable in fact the only one that any rational president should think about you know. um, so I'm going to present option A and B just, just a bit hyperbolically but only slightly to help sharpen what the point is option A is the uh, status quo group 
And essentially, this is the liberal, more liberal element that says, I don't know what all these Cassandras are concerned about. Uh, there's, there's enough money in the Social Security program, for example, to pay benefits until the year 2029, and why should we worry about something that funded until the year 2029? Um, in other words, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Option C are what I call the pure privatizers, and you're going to be hearing a lot from them. You already have. This, in its purest form, is just take the Social Security revenues and put them in the stock market, and the returns will be so high that uh, uh, you can keep all the current benefits. You might even be able to reduce the taxes. And that's the uh, what, what you might call the supply side approach uh, to solving this problem. We'll grow our way, you know, out of the problem. Um, now, both option A and C are politically very attractive, and they're politically correct, because what they're essentially saying to you is you can all uh, uh, keep all the benefits you got, and essentially they're free lunches. In the one case, there's nothing to worry about. In the other case, you're going to make so much money from the stock market that you don't have to worry and you can even have a tax cut. Uh, my option B is politically incorrect because I think there has to be real reform. And incidentally, I collect both oxymorons and uh, euphemisms. Real reform is a euphemism, I want to tell you, because I think real reform must include reduction in benefits. And if you start seeing so-called reform programs without any reduction in benefits, I want to warn you to look very carefully at the numbers that they're suggesting. Now, at the same time, there has to be, in my view, a reduction in benefits. There has to be an increase in real savings, in real funding, which under my program comes in two ways. First, you eliminate the government dis savings, that is the negative savings, and you must, on top of that, increase private savings if we're going to come anywhere near meeting the uh, retirement objectives uh, of our people. Now, let's return to option A, which is essentially <clears throat> that things are all right, and I don't know why the Cassandras are, are worried, uh, because the system is solvent until the year 2029. I was in Chicago the other day, and I said, if you believe that, you'll believe Dennis Rodman uh, has signed up for a course in assertiveness training. Um, <laughs> This, this statement, of course, is based on an outrageous uh, fallacy, namely that the trust fund surpluses, so-called, constitute general savings that can be drawn to pay for the deficits in the later years. I told you earlier I've collected oxymorons. Uh, I started when I was Secretary of Commerce, and someone referred to me once as a powerful Secretary of Commerce. And I said, anybody that knows anything about Washington understands there has never been a powerful Secretary of mm -hmm. Commerce. Maybe Herbert Hoover. I don't know. That would be the only exception. Um, I consider the trust fund an oxymoron. Um, I think it should more accurately be called a distrust fund. Mm -hmm. Because these so-called assets that these people keep talking about are nothing more than IOUs on future uh, taxpayers. Nothing has been put in trust and you're all in business, it's more or less like a memo account that you might have in which you just record that the money has been spent for another purpose that should have been over here. Now, <clears throat> one way of looking at this is to say, suppose the moment there were no trust fund, what difference would it make? That is, what would be different if you didn't have a trust fund? And at least as I analyze it, you'd have to do the exactly the same thing you have to do now. You're either going to have to borrow more money you're either going to have to increase the taxes or you're going to have to reduce the benefits. So it's a, it's a meaningless fiction that has the unfortunate effect of serving as a, as a, a kind of anesthetic, a, anesthesia, really. And uh, in that sense, it's time we start focusing on the real issue, which is how do you take these accounting uh, IOUs and, uh, and, and put them into real IOUs, and what are the implications of that? I'm a huge admirer of Alan Greenspan. Mm -hmm. He testified before the Kerry Danforth Commission that I happened to be on, and he pointed out very clearly 
let's focus on the real issue, which is the net borrowing balance that government has with the public, because that's what has to be taken out of the savings of this country. And let's look, you know, at that uh, issue. Now imagine, we're being told that the system is solvent until the year 2029. But in order for that to be solvent, you would have had to borrow $6.9 trillion, and you would have had to borrow in that year $650 billion just to finance the operating deficits of that system. Now what about the pure privatizers? <clears throat> Their political agenda could not be more different. It's essentially that, that, that they want to replace it with a totally new system of privately owned uh, accounts. Now, quite a few of these privatization schemes that at least I've looked at also have certain elements of a shell game. They, uh, they say, as I indicate, we can leave the benefits alone, we can put the money in the stock market, and at any time, everything's wonderful. What they neglect to tell us, however, or focus on, and I would urge you to focus on this when they come up with some of their proposals, is where are they going to get the money to put into the stock market? That is, if we're going to keep the benefits where they are and run these deficits, presumably somebody has to come up with money that would have been used to pay the benefits. And therefore, it is extremely important that, and I know all of you are very analytical, that you look very coldly at what is called the transition problem. The transition problem is if you're going to move from an unfunded program to a funded program, you go through a very awkward period in which you have to pay for two retirements at the same time, namely our young people and their parents. And, and how you handle that transition cost is an extraordinarily important issue that sometimes get overlooked. There's the issue of risk, of course. The assumption in all these programs somehow is that uh, forevermore you get real returns on equity of 6%, you get a return of 2% on bonds in real terms, and that, that, that differential remains indefinitely without extra risk. Well, try to imagine now what we're talking about. Imagine a situation in which what in effect we're doing, if we intend to leave these programs alone, is borrowing huge amounts of additional money that we fund in order to put it into the stock market. Now, what, what all of us have to think through, and I've had long talks with Bob Rubin about this, and I've urged that he get together some of the best financial uh, market people, not economists, but market people, mm -hmm. to imagine what happens to bond rates and so forth and interest rates. If you try to do this not with new funding, but simply borrowing more money from the government and then putting that money in the stock market, it's a little hard for me to believe but all other things remain equal under those circumstances. Incidentally, what I say to these people that say is, it's easy, just put the money in the stock market and borrow it, is that that kind of arbitrage, where <coughs> all that riskless and painless, why don't we do it with the entire budget? <laughs> that is, why don't we just borrow several trillion dollars, rate of return will be higher on the stock markets than the bonds, and then have a huge refund to the American public. So I, I think as you look at these privatization schemes, I would urge you to examine um, uh, the realities of some of them. Now my own option B program, it goes something like this, and I don't think it's uh, Dr. Kaborke in time, but I leave it to you. I think it's utterly essential we increase the retirement age, and the question is how you do it. I would do it three months a year over the next 20 years, which would get you to 70. And even then, people would be living two to four years longer than was uh, intended. But you must give people time to prepare, which is a euphemism, for time to build up their own private retirement assets in some ways I'll describe in just a moment. Secondly, we obviously ought to look at the cost of living allowances. I'm embarrassed to say I was in the Nixon administration at the time, the venerable Wilbur Mills, who some of you will remember, later became famous for other activities, but uh, <laughs> for a long time, he was a venerable chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, um, decided to run for president, the most improbable uh, event. 
And there's never been a White House who has not been terrified by anybody else running for president. We say we believe in democracy, but any candidate really has a fantasy that he's the only candidate. And therefore, when somebody announces they're running for president, this is trauma time in the White House. So when Wilbur Mills suggested 100% cost of living allowances and a 20% increase in real benefits, I happened to be in the Roosevelt Room when that proposal came up. While my specialty was international economics, it was interesting to see that no one on the political side ever ever asked, what are the costs? They said, obviously, we have to do it. It would be politically disastrous not to do it. But that 100% cost of living allowance decision, which was made in the most casual way, has added, I think, over the last 10 years, $120 billion a year or something. And most people think it's uh, uh, overstated, but clearly we ought to be looking at some kind of diet cola, except for the, the poor. Um, I propose something called an affluence test. Mm-hmm. Among my uh, checkered careers, uh, I was in advertising for a while, and I learned to listen to words. Means test has a way of sounding a bit mean. So I thought affluence test was a little more, um, mm-hmm. a little more solicitous mm-hmm. idea. I would, redu- I would pick some number just above the median income in my plan, let's like say $40,000, and reduce the benefits about 10% a year. And so I mean, most Americans find that idea very palatable because the elderly are essentially very, feel very vulnerable. And what they're really concerned about is what happens if some serious unborn event happens to them. And when they hear there's really a safety net for them, and I argue with my liberal friends, if you damn fools keep insisting on the status quo and you let these huge deficits hit and then have a crisis hit us, then you're really going to have a draconian situation because about half the people in America today, uh, when they're retired, make less than $20,000 a year. And they depend on Social Security for about half of that. So if you suddenly had twice as many retirees and a financial crisis and you had to cut the benefits for everybody, you would at that point be hurting the very people that the liberals say they're most concerned about. Uh, That set of proposals, and there are others, would keep the system in balance for the 21st century, according to what I consider to be reasonable uh, uh, projections. Now, that still leaves us with the problem of insufficient retirement (coughs) funds. I'm probably telling you far less than you already know, but for those of you who haven't looked at this number. Our boomer generation is living in a kind of a, a retirement Disneyland at the moment. Um, surveys show that the majority say, I expect to retire early. I expect to live as well as I'm living now. I don't think I'm going to get all of my Social Security. And yet half of them don't have a company pension. And the median net financial assets it has about $12,000 as they enter their 60s. Now, these are totally incompatible set of objectives, and that's what we're dealing with. So if you accept my premise that the overwhelming problem is we just haven't funded enough of our retirements, we're going to have to figure out a way as we reduce the, the government's dissaving that will occur. We're going to have to increase the savings. Uh, in some way. And the question is, how are you going to do it? Now, about five or six years ago, uh, I was asked uh, by the Competitiveness Policy Council, which was a group set up by the Congress and the White House to look at competitiveness, to chair the Capital Formation Subcommittee. And being a Republican of sorts, at least, uh, my credentials from the far right are often questioned. Uh, I um, was hopeful that these economists, and I got the best ones I could find from MIT, Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, all over the place, that there would be some magic uh, tax incentive that would dramatically increase private savings net, that is, after the cost of the incentive. And what I was to to find was that the results are very ambiguous in America on tax incentive effect on savings. Uh, a fair amount of the so-called money that gets put into IRA accounts, for example. The evidence suggests that a fair amount of that was being saved in other places. And when you you look at the net increase in private savings, it's not nearly as high as we may have hoped. And it's not enough to meet the 
the huge underfunding that I that I mentioned. Mm. And I was interested to find that here there were economists, conservative, independent, liberal, who were almost unanimous not only on that view, but in the American culture, which has since the Second World War, you know, prior to the First World War, we were the biggest savers in the world. Since then, we've been the lousiest savers in the world and the biggest consumers. Because after the Second World War, we built up the whole culture that America's problem was more demand, more consumption. And we just set up a whole bunch of uh, incentives and uh, other pieces of behavior that encourage people to believe they ought to spend more, and that was the answer to all our problems. I uh, have come to the conclusion that many of you may disagree with that we don't have enough time to uh, depend on the marginal effect of tax incentives, and I'm certainly not against tax incentives, but I think I'm being realistic to think that it won't solve the problem, particularly this huge number of people that don't have pensions and very little savings. I've become convinced that we're going to have to follow the example of of Singapore and Chile and so forth and have a mandatory uh, plan. Because unless the, the, uh, the amounts are mandatory, I'm afraid that we won't get savings soon enough and, and in large enough amounts to make a real difference. So I would have a system that required uh, portable, uh, thoroughly vested. Why portable? Well, why portable? Because uh, young workers are facing a world in which they're going to have six or seven jobs in their career. And I think our pension plans must be not only owned by them so the politicians don't spend the money the way they did the last 30 years, but they must be able to take them with them and be, and be vested. So what I'm talking about essentially is a program of reforming the programs, and which is a euphemism for reducing the benefits, and then uh, increasing uh, the level of savings that is uh, required. Now, uh, you can move very rapidly on this program. You can move slowly. But I think it's time that we put the Social Security problem in, the, in a positive context. Because, you know, sacrifice doesn't sell very well politically, you know. <laughs> and uh, while we're talking about cutting benefits, I think that's kind of a tough sale. But if what you're really talking about is the positive of real security in retirement instead of false security, real wealth creation instead of this deficit financing we're talking about, I think you've got a chance of, uh, of selling that. Now, um, will this plan work? Um, I was about to say I'd uh, bet my uh, reputation on that, but I said that once to a client, and he said, Pete, it'll have to be more substantial than that. <laughs> so what I'd suggest, as you look at these programs, and uh, the good news is you're going to be seeing a lot of these programs, you, uh, you ask yourself these five quick questions. One, uh, does this plan cut benefits? And in my view, no plan I've seen will add up without restraining the spending side, which is what this is all about, the benefit side. Uh, so I think it's both fiscally necessary and morally fair to our children that all of us participate in the, in the uh, reduction in benefits, including current unneeded beneficiaries. I'll be 72 in about a month, and I think the idea that the Pete Petersons of this world should be getting subsidized by the government is a morally offensive concept to me. And I think most Americans uh, share that view if they think you're really going to solve the problem. <clears throat> Secondly, do, does the plan try to leave the spending alone and simply raise taxes? As I tried to indicate, um, <clears throat> this problem is too big to be solved by tax taxes. And if you try to increase taxes just to subsidize consumption, it'll have effects on the economy, not to mention politics that I think are unacceptable. Third, does it pay for the transition? And I think those of you who are analytically minded should look at these programs in terms of how much is the spending from all to the current beneficiaries, and does this plan really cover the, the, the cost of that spending? Fourth, does it increase publicly held 
treasury debt. Uh, some of these plans, for example, that simply say leave the benefits alone and let's take uh, X percent of the payroll tax and put it in the stock market. The other side of that is to say what happens to public debt as a result of that. Now, for example, the proposal that you take, uh, I think it's 3% of the payroll and just buy stocks with it, results in a $100 billion increase in publicly finance debt by the year 2000. And I think last year we borrowed, what, 80 billion, 85 billion. Uh, it's very important for you to look at what happens to the publicly held debt, which is what I think we should be focusing on. Um, now, if I were to predict what happens if we do nothing, uh, when will the crisis appear? And I, and I hope to hell we do something. In, in a moment I'll indicate why there is basis for some optimism. Mm -hmm. I would think the first shot across the bow is going to be in the financial markets. In other words, if you imagine a scenario where the politicians of the world say, this is the third rail of politics, and I can't do anything about it, so why don't I try it? I can't raise taxes. Why don't I try to finance my way out of this by borrowing money from the rest of the world? I think it'll be in the global financial markets where you'll see the first uh, evidence of this aneurysm. And whether it happens very gradually and you see real rates go up substantially as people contemplate 30-year bonds. That we don't want to confront because it means somebody has to give up something. And the fifth question I would suggest you ask of any reform program is, does it increase savings? And it is my thesis that you cannot solve this problem without <coughs> funding additional savings. So I would urge you to look at what it does to real increases uh, uh, in savings. Uh, an oxymoron on the Nixon administration uh, would have been a Nixon humorist. I know there are people that don't think we had anybody in that administration that's humorous, but we had one person. That was Herb Stein, who once said, uh, if something's unsustainable, it tends to stop. Hmm? <laughs> uh, if you don't like that one, if your horse dies, we suggest you dismount, you know? <laughs> um, the numbers I'm presenting to you today are so unthinkable as to not be sustainable. So I'm not suggesting for a moment that we could ever live in that scenario. I present the numbers suggest they have to stop. And the question is, what do we do? And do we wait for a crisis of some sort and then at the last minute engage in a lot of draconian stuff, which I think would have very serious social, not to mention fiscal implications? Or do we start getting our act together? Now, there are some encouraging signs. Uh, the President of the United States for the first time in the State of the Union message, uh, said, uh, there's a real problem out there. I'm going to take the surpluses and save Social Security first. Now, you've got a long discussion of what that really means, but at least it put it on the agenda. Secondly, he called for four national conferences on Social Security. There was one on May 7th at, uh, in Kansas City. And he asked the Concord Coalition that I helped found with Warren Redmond and Paul Sangas to co-host it with the AARP, which is the strangest pair of bedfellows in the history of, um, of American life. Um, but there it was. And there was the President of the United States saying, we've got a problem, we have to do something about it. There were Democratic Senator Bob Kerry, whom I've come to admire a good deal, standing up and saying, we've got to do something about it, here's my program. We do something about retirement age, we do something about COLAs, we're going to start putting some of the money uh, that he gets from that in the stock market. Now, it's not enough to solve the problem by a long shot, but it is a very important uh, indication that it's not the third rail of American politics, and it can be discussed. Bob Kerry ran in my home state of Nebraska in 96. He chaired this entitlement commission. He stood up and said, there's an unsustainable problem here. And he won election by 10 percentage points in Nebraska. So I think the idea 
that it's unthinkable to discuss this problem is beginning to disappear. One of the reasons it's beginning to disappear is the stock market has been so wonderful and people are so cynical about their public officials that the idea of having something in their own accounts that might grow is turning out to be very appealing to people. So I would predict something I would not have uh, predicted um, even a year ago. I think the odds are now moving to the 50-50 range. They might have been in the 1% range two years ago. That in 1999, you're going to see some uh, significant reform take place. It won't be a program nearly as major as mine, because we tend to do things incrementally in life. But I think it will include some combination of a small reduction in benefits for the long term with putting some money uh, in, in, in the private sector. Now, the other good news, I think, is for those of us in this room, uh, all of us are in the asset management business. And if I had to stake my reputation on something, and I've told you what other people think that's worth, but if I were to do that, I think the global asset management business is going to be one of the great growth businesses of the next uh, 10 to 20 years. For the simple reason that the realization will grow that the public retirement systems are simply not sustainable and people can't depend on them and it's going to become essential that we figure out ways of increasing the private retirement which means more money available not just in the United States but globally so I think not only the collection of those savings but the management of those savings is going to become a major business and I think people now are so cynical about the U.S. government or governments anywhere, because you all know what happened. When Social Security was started, the th I don't know if you've ever read the theory of Social Security. It was during this wonderful demographic period, you know, when the boomers were growing and paying taxes. Those surpluses would be set aside, you know, and those savings then would be available to pay the benefits later. We you know what happened. That money was spent. And it was not invested, it was spent on consumption. These elderly programs are about the purest form of consumption I can think of. And if you look at the increase in benefits that took place, they're way, way above anything that had been originally intended. The public is getting to know the, that their money has been spent, not saved. And therefore, I don't think they're going to be happy with the idea of turning this over to the government. They're going to be saying, let's make it privately managed so that it's owned by the people, so the politicians can't take it away from them. So the good news in this sea of daunting melancholy numbers I've given you is that I think the asset management business is going to be a growth business. If I can be permitted a 20 second commercial, um, we're in the asset management business. And one of the reasons we're in that business is that we think it's a great growth business. And we're, for your purposes, aside from private equity, we're also putting a huge push on the alternative asset management business in some ways that I think are somewhat unique, but I'm prejudiced. If anybody's interested in our material, we'd be glad to give it to you. That's the end of the commercial. Uh, so why don't I take your questions, if you have any, and thank you very much. I'm not sure in this forum you should spend a lot of time on this question, but I don't know who else to ask it of. In this imperfect world, is there a bunch of things in our Constitution or that fail to get into our Constitution that put us in this fix? Well, I don't think the Constitution. We might have needed a federal accounting board to have some accounting principles. You see, the capacity to set up fictitious accounts that we call trust funds and <coughs> pretend as though these off-budget, fictitious uh, paper numbers were real and therefore telling the American people that you're taken care of because there's a trust fund. It's too bad there wasn't something in the Constitution about that mm -hmm. because it, I find it ironic that everybody around this table who has pension plans are rigorously governed 
by ERISA, fiduciary responsibilities, you know, prudent man and all this sort of thing. And yet with numbers that are hundreds of times bigger than that, everybody's money. None of these principles apply and we spent the money. So it's just too damn bad that we permitted um, off-budget um, fictitious accounting techniques. That's not a constitutional issue, but it's what I think led to uh, this problem. Yes? I think the, uh, uh, you know, we have an opportunity now in the sense that we have a, a relatively low unemployment rate. We've had right. uh, ex- expanded uh, tax receipts. We have a president who, who cannot run for re-election again. Um, so he's got, uh, he's got a, a couple more years left in his, in his final term. Um, we've, we've had the umpteen uh, bipartisan uh, commissions over the years to, you know, quote unquote, study the problem and come up with, uh, with alternatives. This is really the time to do it. <laughs> you say 1999. I mean, it's, it, it, it is 1999. Because if it isn't 1999, it isn't going to happen. Or it's, it's, you know, we're just going to postpone it's it. It's the perfect time. And it's a, it's a benign period demographically at the moment, which is good. Incidentally, before, while on balance, I'm optimistic. Never underestimate the capacity of politicians to um, be a touch disingenuous. Mm-hmm. Under certain circumstances, mm-hmm. my friend Burstein here came back from the Renaissance weekend to say you would not have enjoyed the um, discussion of the president. I believe you told me, who um, kept referring to the trust fund keeping the system solvent mm-hmm. until the year 2029. And I was disappointed to hear that because I've talked to the president several times about this, and he is the single most informed policy one that has ever occupied the White House. Just mm-hmm. trust me on that. So I happened to see the president when was it in February somewhere. And he said he wanted to talk to me about entitlement. At the end of a very intense discussion where he showed total knowledge of the CCI, about the Athlons test, about retirement ages and so forth. I said, well how often do you get to be one on one with the president? So why don't I just take a shot at it? Mr. President you don't believe in this trust fund business, do you? Hmm. He said, oh, God, no. He said, everybody knows the pays your go system and all that matters the annual operating deficit. I said, well, I was relieved. Except that Kansas City, if you watch television, there was a chart presented by the White House that showed the problem was totally taken care of until the year 2029. <laughs> the trust fund. So I asked one of the aides, how does this come about? And they said, well, it's politics. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, it's going to be a bumpy road. Uh, everything, I agree totally with you. If we, and you didn't mention a good stock market, which kind of makes people optimistic. Everything, the stars are aligned properly at the moment. As I say, I think the odds are at least 50%. Something's going to happen. But politicians do strange things. Labor unions are very powerful. You got Gebhardt. You got a friend here from France. I haven't mentioned the political problems in Europe. I thought the ARP was formidable until I went to a conference in Europe. And I said, "Oh my God, I'll take our problems anytime uh, compared to the problems in Europe." Labor unions in this country are very potent. By and large, they're not sympathetic to uh, reforming the system. On the Kerry Danforth Commission, we have 31 members. 20 senators and congressmen, 11 of us from the private sector, 30 out of the 31 people signed a report that was half-breaking. It said the current programs are totally unsustainable. By the year 2030, every dollar of tax revenue would be required to pay for entitlements. There would be nothing left for interest, defense, the FBI, or anything, and something had to be done. And these are Republicans, Democrats. One member didn't sign that report. Guess who it was? The head of the coal miners union, who is the number two or three man in the labor movement. So the labor movement will put a lot of pressure on this issue, I'm I'm afraid, against this. You know Mr. Gephardt is running for office. I think you know Mr. Gore is running for office. It will be very interesting to see how the politics of this play out when they confront 
of reform. The AARP, in my opinion, has never met a reform that they like. And in the uh, Kerry Danforth Commission, uh, we had an interesting dialogue that's on videotape. You remember Al Simpson, the senator from Wyoming, had a wonderful sense of humor. Peterson was P, and he was next to me, and the ARP testifies, and he and I say, well, this is our opportunity here. They had just testified on the great need on Medicare to pay for prescription drugs, to pay for long-term care, and there's a whole bunch of specific benefits on top of the current program that they were for. They were models of specificity when it came to whatever they wanted to add. So in my usual delicate way, I, I uh, attack them of uh, uh, diversion, disingenuousness, and something else. I forgot. It was a huh? denial. Denial. I said, yeah, it was a series of alliterations. I said, you were remarkably specific when it came to what you wanted more let's talk about how we're going to pay for what we now have because we all agree except for one person it's sustainable they became models of confiscation and uh, ambiguity we'll be willing to work with you well we say you're an organization that has had plenty of time to think about this start working with us what do you want to do I was in Chicago last week at a Songus policy forum senior representative of the ARP we could not get a single reform recommendation out of them. Mm. There are a lot of generalities about how it's a problem. We're going to have to work together, and you know, with goodwill, we can solve it. And, and a lot of soothing uh, rhetoric. So I think everything's aligned. It's the best chance we've had, certainly in the 15 years by far. But there are other forces that are uh, on the other side of this question. And one of the biggest political questions in the next century is when the young people are going to get active in politics mm -hmm. because, you know, they're a little bit like that kid in the, in the uh, philosophy class, you know, in which the philosophy professor says, what's worse, ignorance or apathy? And some kid from the back of the class says, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know at what point the political dynamic. There's some wonderful young people's group, Third Millennium is one of them, and they're getting college chapters because they realize it's their future we're talking about. Mm. So the situation has never been better. But on the other hand, uh, don't underestimate the forces of denial and the forces mm. that really don't want to do anything. Mm. Any other? Yes, sir. Um, can I actually bring a question I have? What? Why? Has it been that the generation that has had such a shared cathartic experience as the depression in World War II has not been able to solve this problem previous to this? And what gives us hope that generation that is going to have to solve this problem has not had a shared cathartic experience, say Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, since I'm in a, of that generation, I wonder about it. Remember, ours is a generation that fought the World War. We had the GI benefit plan for education. We built a mass highway system. And for much of our history, we were running balanced budget, you know, budget surpluses. And then the thing shifted, as you, as you well know. And uh, I wish I, I'm not a, I'm not even an economist, let alone a historian or a sociologist as to how this culture changed to my generation. I happen to be a son of Greek immigrants and I was brought up with the American dream and parents working hard and saving and, and so forth. And how we got transformed into this um, boomer mentality of I want it all and I want it now and kind of the hell with the future is a, is a terribly profound subject that I don't bring any specific credentials to. On the other hand, uh, uh, I had the opportunity to speak to elderly groups. Uh, I was on a 60-minute show with regard to uh, a book that I did. And Leslie Stahl, in the great tradition of 60 Minutes, mm. said, we'll, we'll do your book if you will appear in a retirement village. That's a fairly daunting uh, assignment with my agenda because I'm not <laughs> a politician, obviously. So I stood up there and had pictures of my grandchildren and shared experiences and you know how old would young Peter Carey be when this hit and 
and the morality of, uh, you know, Bonhoeffer said the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world it leaves to its children. And I approached it from a moral standpoint and it was a generational standpoint. And I presented this program and at the end of it, Leslie Stahl said, all right, you're going to vote yes or no. How many of you will vote for the program he's presented, which is what I laid out today? And I was just amazed, 150 people there, and all but about five of them said, I can support that program. Mm -hmm. And I learned from talking with them that the minute the elderly hear that there's a fair program that doesn't rob their kids, but protects them in the event that they have tough times, that they're vulnerable, understandably. They're worried about something happening to them. They relax. So I said to them, I'm really puzzled. How many of you are members of the ARP? And virtually everybody put up their hand. I said, why on earth, how on earth could you be members of the ARP and support a program with Pete Peterson? And I said, oh, no, they don't represent us on policy. We just get travel discounts, health care discounts, <laughs> prescription drugs, insurance, and so forth. Right. So, you know, we've got this superstructure in Washington in which the conventional wisdom is you can't touch this third rail and so forth. That's not my experience when you talk to the public. Uh, the surveys are now showing that 89% of the American people think we ought to reform Social Security. And the system is not secure. You know the cliche finding that twice as many young people believe in UFOs as believe they're going to get Social Security. Mm. Uh, uh, I have never been more optimistic that there can be change if you don't frighten people. You see, if you don't scare them into believing that they're going to be living a life of poverty. And that's why I think it is very important that we emphasize that there will be a safety net there for people that need it. If you start removing that, then I think you'll have an impossible political problem because the politicians can play them to the fear uh, uh, syndrome. But there isn't any reason you can't have a safety net and do what I propose. Have I exhausted you? Or <laughs> we'll up, uh, one more question? Yeah. What do you think the chances are of increasing the uh, retirement age? Well, it has to be done in a humane way. For example, this fellow Trumpka was his name, was the head of the coal miners union. He's now the number two man of labor union. If you were the head of the coal miners union, you would react to the idea of increasing retirement age with predictable, restrained life of enthusiasm, put it gently. You're going to have to come up with something, in my opinion, that takes into account physical aspects of people who are not in good enough health to work longer. But the blunt fact is, that thank God for medical and other lifestyle changes the vast majority of, of people that are 70 are fully capable or 68 are fully capable of working but you must do it gradually all of this must be done gradually and to me the great case for starting in this great benign period we have now of doing it is you then have 10 or 20 years to prepare for this and the worst thing you can do is to wait for a crisis and then have to do it suddenly. I think if you do it gradually and you make allowances for people that are disabled and, and, and so forth, it's a tough sale, but I think you can do it uh, gradually. It is an absolutely indispensable part of the solution. <coughs> uh, I've got a, written a book on the subject of the benefit cuts. Uh, it's uh, well over two thirds or seventy percent of it. Uh, it's the most important thing you can do to reduce benefits. The, the most important thing. Okay. On that note, we'll we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Peterson. You. The, nice to be here.